Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? It's good to see everybody. Good to see some smiling faces. And uh, man, it's always a, a, a privilege um, to be able to um, share the Word of God, uh, whether it be at your home church or a church that you're called to be a part of. And so thank you for having me here today. Uh, just kind of a share a, a brief history of, of myself. Um, my name's Damian Sorrentioni. I know Pastor Barry was having a hard time uh, pronouncing my name, and he was joking with me earlier. Uh, I come from a very Italian, uh, very Catholic background. I grew up in uh, Buffalo, New York. I uh, surrendered to ministry uh, in 1995, moved to Vegas in 94, and uh, surrendered at a little church down the way uh, at Oki and Arville. It was uh, West Oki Baptist Church at the time. And uh, God just um, started pull pulling and tugging at my heart. I, I ended up uh, getting a Bachelor of uh, Science at UNLV. I met my wife. We got married in June of 2000. Um, so we've been married next year. It'll be 15 years for us. We have two kids. My son Andrew is nine. My daughter Malia is seven. And um, before we had our kids, though, um, God called my wife and I to go to seminary. We went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in, in um, 2000, right after we got married and moved back here. This coming October will be 11 years. And so I've been at Shadow Hills ever since. So a little brief history. If you have any questions for me afterwards, feel free to come up and, and talk to me. But I'm just going to jump right into the sermon. And I uh, just want to just ask you a few questions right off the bat. Do you ever feel like your relationship with Jesus is sometimes a little bit shallow? I'm not asking for hands to go up or anything along those lines, but do you ever feel that there's a huge difference in how you relate to God and how you relate to your closest friends? Um, have you ever come to the point where you came to uh, uh, long for a deeper and authentic relationship uh, with Jesus, uh, something that feels a little bit more real for you? Um, you know, th this week as... Um, we kind of talk about the life of Christ. I know Pastor Mark shared a little bit about diving into God's word last week. Um, we're gonna um, kind of unlock um, that real deep relationship uh, with Jesus. And the reality of our relationship with Jesus obviously centers around the cross. You have a beautiful cross that's uh, behind me up here. You know, without the cross, we cannot have the relationship with Jesus. And, uh, you know, I wanna think, think about it for a second. Think about a beautiful cross behind me. Maybe you have crosses that uh, adorn your house in various areas. A lot of us wear crosses around our necks, you know, wear, wear them on our bracelets, things along those lines. And, uh, you know, the symbol of Jesus's kingdom and power was an instrument of death. And in Jesus's day, obviously, people didn't wear crosses around their necks. They didn't put them in their homes. They didn't have them as decals on their cars or anything along those lines. And, uh, you know, a, a, the cross was that tool of death. And a lot of times we think that is a little bit strange. But Jesus deliberately used an instrument of death as a symbol of his kingdom and as a symbol of his power. I think one of the most peculiar um, lessons that Jesus taught his followers is found in Luke chapter 9 verses 18 through 24. And if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn there with me. Maybe you have your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad, tablet, Android, Galaxy, whatever it may be. I know modern times are changing, but I like the old Bible right in my hand here. I'll give you a second to turn there. Luke chapter 9 beginning at verse 18. This is Peter's confession of Christ. In verse 18, God's word says, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah and still others, the one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on that third day be raised to life. Then he said to them, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You know, crucifixion was obviously a horrid way uh, to die. And if you lived in the early first century, the cross would uh, typically be uh, obviously that symbol of terror, it would be a symbol of shame uh, for anyone. And it seems to be an upside down way in our minds today to, to kind of run a kingdom. And yet as we examine Jesus and as we examine Jesus's ministry, we find that's exactly what makes Jesus's teachings, I would say, so intriguing. He taught some kind of crazy things, you know, crazy doctrines such as he taught that the first would be last. 
you know, that slavery would lead to freedom, that weakness would make us strong, and that if, we, if, uh, if you lose your life for his sake, you will what? You will save it. He says that life can be found in death, and of course, that the symbol of power is an instrument of death as we are talking about the cross. You know, Jesus' teachings were different to the way that people would ordinarily come to the point and look at life. But that's always been true of God. You know, God tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, verses eight through nine, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. You know, at the very heart of the nature of God's plan, it has always been the cross for us. And this teaching about the cross, I think, is a lot of times so difficult for us to wrap our minds around uh, uh, that, you know, that kind of Paul gets, comes to the point where he was trying to wrap his mind, and he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Those who have not asked him into their heart to be Lord of their lives, they will not have an understanding. They will not gain the, the magnitude of the cross because the living God has not been introduced and dwelling within their hearts to help them gain that understanding of who Christ can be in their lives. But before we kind of unpack that, I, I want to back up a minute and examine the setting uh, of our text this morning. You know, Jesus has just come to the point where he has sent out the 12. You know, he has kind of, you know, he's, he's established his ministry and he is kind of launching these men out to do some more ministry, you know, for him. So that's, that's happening right now. And right before this, there was the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, now, and Jesus is now at a point where he's just kind of calling his disciples and he's pulling them and taking them aside and basically just having a time of, of group uh, intimate prayer with them. And, we, and he finishes his prayer time. He seems kind of, you know, almost to the point where he casually turns and he, he looks to his men and he simply just says, who do, who do people say that I am? Who do they say that I am? And he responds, the disciples. They respond, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. You know, and you think about it, you know, uh, in that response, all these men had already passed on. And I think we can imagine why the crowds were visualizing Jesus as being one of these great men who had been risen from the dead. You know, he did things that no mortal man could do at this particular time. He was feeding thousands with only a small amount of food. He was healing the sick and spending time with the lame and healing the lepers, spending time with the least, the sad, the poor. He was raising people from the dead and uh, things, again, that no mortal man could do at this time. And so the people were reasoning and so he, he, they were thinking in their minds, so he must be one of the great men of the past that has come back from the dead. You know, and I think Jesus allows them to exhaust, I would say, these speculations that they'd heard from the crowds and then he asks his disciples. You know, he knows what the crowd are saying about him, but then he says, you know, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, who's never at a loss for words at times, he simply responds, you are the Christ. You are the Christ, which in other words is you are the Messiah. And if we were to look in Matthew 16, we're told a little bit more about Peter's response where he says, Peter answered, he says, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus replies immediately, he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. That's Matthew 16, verses 16 through 17. You know, as I read this text, you know, I, I start to get to wondering, you know, why would Jesus come to the point where he would ask the question to begin with? You know, I mean, Jesus, isn't he, all, uh, uh, he's God's son, God's all-knowing, but he wanted this answer to be important to these men. He wanted this answer to be so important to these men. Jesus knows you know, what the people have been saying about him. He knows what the Peter and the disciples believe about him. So again, you know, why ask the question? Because he needed for them to come right out and say it, to take ownership, to take ownership of acknowledging the love, to acknowledging the respect and commitment of the relationship to their master. He needed them to quote, kind of define the relationship. So if you're taking notes, my first point is that he needed for the disciples to commit to what they believed about him. He needed for the disciples to commit to what they believed about him. Because everything that Jesus came to do hinges on that statement. Everything, everything that Jesus came to do hinges on the statement in Peter's confession where he says, 
Jesus is the Christ. Everything. It's the foundation of our faith. It's the foundation of the church. And in fact, that's what Jesus says to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, again, where he says, on this rock, I will what? I will build my church. On this rock, you know, the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, I will build my church. The apostle Paul later writes that no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 3, 11. And I think this is so significant and it's more than just a, a creedal statement or a password that we give along you know, with a secret handshake when people walk the aisles to come and join our churches. It's a declaration of faith. It is a declaration of commitment, I would say, to Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. So Jesus is setting the stage by getting his men to verbalize this truth. He's setting the stage to getting these men to verbalize this truth. He needed to know that these men who gave up their livelihood to follow, he needed to know that they were committed to him as he was launching his ministry and as, as he was empowering them to establish their ministry as they were going forth. But then Jesus adds another layer to his teaching and he says that the son of man must suffer. Luke nine twenty two tells his disciples, the son of man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on that third day be raised to life. I started to think again and study and say, you know, why would Jesus say this to them at this particular point? You know, and I believe it was because it was not enough for his men to simply believe that Jesus was the son of God. You know, the promise of Jesus' suffering and vindication is, is predicted uh, for the first time to these men as they were establishing their ministry and as they were following their master. You know, the disciples struggle to grasp what Jesus is really saying to them. Jesus gradually reveals the full scope of his work in later scriptures, and I think it's hard to, for us to appreciate um, since we are 2,000 years removed um, from this day and time, but to the hear of the Messiah coming, you know, think about it. They're starting to follow. They're starting to do the very things that Jesus is asking them to do. But then having to hear that he was going to leave was hard for these men to understand. You know, but Jesus needed for his men to understand because many doubted. And in fact, many skeptics today still discount the idea that Jesus came for the explicit purpose for dying for our sins. You know, they believe that he was simply a nice man who got caught up with the political intrigues of the day and got himself crucified for his troubles. Even Peter, I think, was tempted to look at Jesus at certain times with his walk with Christ and uh, see Jesus in human terms. When Christ told his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem to die, uh, Peter was appalled. In Matthew 16, 22, he cries, never, Lord. He said, never, Lord, never should this happen to you. Peter even went so far in the Garden of Gethsemane when the Roman officials came to arrest our Jesus. He went as so far as to you know, strike the ear with a sword and cut the ear off of an official you know, Peter didn't want a Jesus who would die. He didn't want a Jesus who would die. In spite of a good confession, he still looked at Jesus as just one more mortal teacher at times. You know, those who look at Jesus in this way tend to view Christianity as just one more of the many world religions that are out there, one more plate of that uh, great buffet of uh, religious teachings from which they can pick and choose what they want to at different times. But if Jesus came to this earth, if Jesus came to this earth specifically to die on the cross for the sins of the world, for you and me, then Jesus not only taught a great set of lessons, but he loved us so much. He loved us so much that he was willing to pay the price for our sins and die on the cross. And because he did this, because he did this, he has claim to a much higher truth than any other religions out there. While other religious founders have taught some good, None of them ever gave their lives to their people like our Jesus. None of them gave their lives for their people. And now that brings us again to the uh, crazy and awesome teachings of Jesus we started with, that Jesus needed to hear his disciples commit to what they believed about him. And then the second point, if you're taking notes, Jesus tells his disciples, he tells the disciples, as we just read, that they must deny themselves. They must deny themselves and pick up their cross daily. 
deny themselves and pick up their cross daily. And I think it's always helpful to look at a statement like this in context and realize first, Peter declares that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus uses this confession to teach about his imminent death. But then there's a call to silence. And Jesus tells them not to say anything. You know, this Messiah must suffer before his greatness is completely manifest. The disciples needed instruction. They needed instruction on the kind of Messiah that Jesus will be and what is in store for those who follow him. For what is in store for those who follow him in the journey of rejection, in the journey of exaltation, in the journey of glory in their walk with him. You know, God's plan for the Messiah is not what the disciples are thinking at this particular time. And Jesus is starting to build upon these truths and he's saying, you know, I am the son of God. I've come to die for your sins. I'm gonna be taking up my cross for you. But now I need you. I need you to take up your cross for me. And so we ask and we, we, we sit here this morning and we listen and we say, okay, well, how do we do that? How do I take up my cross and follow him? Do I need to erect a wooden cross and have someone you know, put nails through my hands and my feet? No, no that's not, not what Jesus wanted. You know, the pathway of Jesus, though, if you think about it, in light of where he is going was hard. You know, Jesus is trying to prepare these men for the journey and in the original language, um, it's a continual process of following. It's a continual process of following. It's not a pick and choose, but it is a call to discipleship, to follow and deny yourself in an ongoing state. Submitting to God, submitting to God and following Jesus means walking the road of rejection and self-denial within that ongoing state on a daily basis. You think about the word deny. Deny means to refuse. We must refuse to fulfill our own personal agenda and our own interests and even our own welfare. We must refuse to manipulate the things and the people around us uh, to gain advantage for ourselves. We can no longer be consumed with fulfilling our own goals. We must be selfless and we must think of others a whole lot more than we think of ourselves. Denying our needs and consulting God for the smallest of details in our lives. We often go to God with the big details of our lives, don't we? But what about those small, small details of our lives? Jesus desires to reveal to us the Father's will. His entire ministry was based on the premise that he had come to this earth for no other reason than to do the will of the Father. And he expects nothing less from us as his children but to do the Father's will. You know, have you ever come to the point where you wanted something so bad? No hands need to go up, but where you wanted something so bad that you started praying about it and praying about it and praying about it. And maybe... It was two days, maybe it had been a week, maybe it had been three months, maybe three years, maybe 30 years, but you didn't get exactly what you wanted. Anyone ever been there? If I asked you to raise your hands, I know all our hands would go up. But I wanna ask you, in that process of your prayer, in that process of waiting, you know, how did you respond? How did you respond to that? Because I think our response could be a reflection of whether or not you're one who is taking up your cross daily. You know, if you're found moving forward with him and waiting on his timing and accepting and still staying committed, then I would say that you are probably one who is content in taking up your cross on a daily basis. You know, there's a quote by A.W. Tozer and he described it in, in, in three things. He said that people who are crucified with Christ have three distinct marks. People who are crucified with Christ have three distinct marks. Number one is they are facing in one direction. They're facing one direction. Number two, they're not turning back. They're facing one direction. They're not turning back. And number three, they no longer have plans for themselves. They no longer have plans of their own. You know, I want you to think about that for a couple moments. You know, the Christian who picks up their cross and follows Jesus has decided that their life is not their own. Believers, I think, uh, often get confused by this and act one way in certain situations and tend to act another way in other situations. Act godly 
in this situation and sometimes tend to act ungodly, you know, in this situation over here. Get what I'm saying? They'll be in church, gather as the body of Christ on a Sunday morning, give of their time to serve Jesus and his church, they'll give of their money to support church and their missions. Yes, they'll teach and sing and go on mission trips, but I, I, I've known people throughout ministry um, who've done particular things like that their entire lives, but they've never actually felt the weight of the cross in their lives. They did what they did because that was what they were expected to do. They did it because they felt they had to, acting one way but not allowing the cross to truly penetrate their lives to gain the understanding of the weight of the cross. You know, God so desires, our Heavenly Father so desires an active relationship with his people. He's not looking for cookie cutter Christians who are doing the same thing all the time or people who are saying the right things at the right times. He wants to dig into our lives. He wants to be real with us on a daily basis, but there's one thing that tends to get in the way at times and that one thing is ourselves. I want you to take a moment, watch this short video and get an outstanding picture of I think how we often tend to treat our Heavenly Father. <laughs> Do you get it? It's an interrupting no. cow, he interrupts. That's what he does, he's a moo, right? That is so dumb, it's a knock knock Dumb, it's joke. funny. Hey, Laura. She's, hey. oh. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. What are you doing? It's me, it's Jesus. Lord, we take up our cross every day for you. Oh, thank you, uh, but the cross is where it begins, not ends. Thou art the beginning and the end, Lord, Alpha and Omega. It's all about you, oh. Jesus. Uh, guys, I, I just want you to be real with me. You are the air I breathe. You are the air I breathe. <laughs> Drew, I think it's great when you worship me. Oh yes, praise you, Lord Jesus. It's just that sometimes, Feels like you're putting on a show. Oh, Jesus, please forgive me for putting on a show and oh, being fake. Uh, okay, I, I forgive you. Oh, praise you for okay. your grace, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Guys, just say what you would normally say. Praise the Luya. No, I mean, like, you know, if, if we were talking, you know, say what you'd say. Okay. Um, Drew, tell us a joke. What? Yeah, I mean... You know, like you were before. Thou art holy, Lord. That's not a joke. Oh, yeah. No, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> what are you guys doing? Jesus, we're living for you just like we always do. Don't live for me. Live in me. When you live in me, you'll understand who you are and what you're living for. I just want something a little bit deeper. But if this is all you want. I think uh, it's a good video. I think unfortunately it's, it hits home sometimes. But I love in that video where he says, don't live for me, live in me. He says, don't live for me, live in me. You know, are you, are, are you consumed with our Lord and allow Jesus to live in you? Is your identity found in him? Do you understand that after accepting him as Lord and Savior of your life that your desires should decrease and his desires should what? They should increase. But we cannot know those desires if like Pastor Mark shared with you guys last week, we must be men and women that are spending time studying God's word. Because what happens when you study God's word? You start learning, you start growing. You learn about him, then you're able to learn to what it means to be committed to him, to deny yourself, to take up your cross, to hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit moving, guiding, and directing as it should. You'll have that greater understanding. We need not just play the part. You know, ask yourself, are you the same person um, uh, in church with Jesus as you are in the workplace with Jesus? Are you the same person in church with Jesus as you are in the grocery store with Jesus, as you are driving the streets with Jesus? Are you living in him, allowing his identity to shine through you, giving him your all? Because when we come uh, and, and when you understand, when you understand your commitment to him, you deny your desires, you take on his desires, and you then understand 
if you're taking notes, as we go into the third point, that our identity in Christ comes from understanding the weight of the cross. Our identity in Christ comes from understanding the weight of the cross and identifying with Jesus. You know, there was a certain businessman that uh, was visiting uh, in uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and uh, he was um, visiting and going to one of the passion plays there. Uh, They did an awesome portrayal uh, of of the life of Christ, and afterwards, he started to go mix and mingle and meet with the crowds, and uh, he he was intrigued by the guy who played Jesus, so he started to go talking with him, but he was distracted as he was talking with him because they saw the cross that was kind of laying on the ground there and so he kind of gave his camera uh, to the actor didn't care about the conversation anymore said hey I want you to take your you know my picture with the cross so he lifts up the cross you know and now the cross was not a light cross it was a heavy cross he's kind of grunting and lifting and and he just he got to the point where he's like man he's like why is this thing so heavy why is this so heavy? I thought it would be hollow. And it was quoted in a newspaper um, that uh, the actor who played Jesus, he smiled. Uh, he said, it said, with a smile of compassion, the actor answered, and it was quoted, if I could not feel the weight of it, it would be impossible for me to play the part. If I could not feel the weight of it, it would be impossible for me to play the part. The actor had to come to the point where he felt the weight of the cross. And you ask, how do I do that? How do I feel the weight of the cross? Can you identify with the weight of the cross? You know, after Jesus' trial and after he'd been beaten and mocked by the Roman soldiers, they put a cross on his shoulders. They forced him to walk the streets of Jerusalem, you know, to the place of his execution. But somewhere along the way, the cruelty of his punishment, the exhaustion of spending probably the last 16 plus hours, you know, um, getting drilled and uh, yelled at and tried before the Sanhedrin, before Herod, before Pilate, And the weight of the cross combined to the point that he just couldn't carry it any further. Couldn't carry it any further. And so the Romans officials, they got a man from the crowd and said, you need to take up this cross. That man was Simon of Cyrene. And we know that name because, you know, up until that moment, uh, Simon had just been a nameless bystander. He was just part of the crowd. But once he carried the cross, once he carried the cross, his life changed. Once he felt the weight of the cross as he was walking up that hill, it had such an impact on his life that he became a follower of Jesus. And not only him, but we read in Mark that his sons Alexander and Rufus were affected. His boys are named along with him because Simon's experience at the cross impacted his entire family. Simon felt the weight of Jesus' cross. Many of us often play the game of Jesus coming on the scene, kind of like the video I, I showed, and we're all on it and we're putting him first. But then at other moments, we're kind of hypocritical and we find ourselves turning back to our, to our old ways of sin. But to pick up our cross, we must not look back. To pick up our cross, we must not look back. It's like that old familiar hymn, and I'm sure you guys have sung, sung it here many of times. But it's that old hymn where it says what? It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. And what is that next part? No turning back, amen. No turning back. It's like the quote I shared with you about Tozer, facing one direction, not turning back, and no longer having plans uh, of our own, but having plans of what the hot father has for us, understanding what it means to take up our cross. You know, as we move into a time of uh, uh, decision and commitment, I just have some questions uh, for you to ponder. You know, if you are taking notes, you can write them down. But the first one is, is God satisfied with you only giving him the spiritual side of yourself? Is God satisfied with you only giving him the spiritual side of yourself? And I want you to think about these questions over the next week. I'll say that first one one more time. Is God satisfied with you only giving him the spiritual side of yourself? The second one is, what does it mean to live in Christ. What does it mean for you, particularly today, to live in Christ? And what is God's desire for relationship with you? What is God's desire for relationship with you? You know, as you think of those questions, maybe God's calling you to uh, to make a decision this morning. You know, but ask yourself, are you giving him your spiritual self 
or are you giving him your whole self? Does your relationship with Jesus look like the video that we watched, looking reverent but lacking depth? It's a question only you can answer. Are you feeling the weight of the cross and honoring your Savior on a daily basis? Maybe you need to tell and share with uh, one of our yoke fellows uh, this morning that that video is your life and that you want more of him in your life. You know, are you committing to his ways and denying yourself and understanding that your identity is not in yourself, but your identity is in our heavenly father? I hope you can say that. Stand with me, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father God, we just, uh, we just bow our heads and our hearts and we just thank you so much for this time together today. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would understand that our whole purpose of our walk with you is to glorify the name of Christ, to lift up the cross, and that is the message of the cross, the emphasis of the cross, the Christ of the cross. Father, I ask that you give us strength in, uh, to commit ourselves to what the cross stands for and to be reminded what is at the core of our life and that is our commitment to you, Jesus, and to you alone. Father, there might be some people here this morning that have never placed their trust in you. Father, I pray that you would give them wisdom and that you would give them encouragement and strength to come forth and possibly meet with one of our yoke fellows to learn what it means to have that personal commitment with you. For those who need a fresh start, Father, I pray you'd give them strength to put you first. Maybe someone needs to spend time at these steps just crying out to you, saying they want more depth in their relationship with you. Father God, I just pray, Lord God, that for those of us who are believers in you, that we would continue to live in you. And may we allow you to live through us, to shine through us, to shine your light in this world of darkness. Father God, I pray that as we close this time, Lord, that uh, if anyone does need to talk to one of our yoke fellows, that they'd come forth as this song is sung. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for who you are within our hearts and within our lives and all that you could be in someone's heart and life. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you.